typical marketing question tends to be around attribution. So many tools help you analyze within the bubble of that tool. So it's simple to leverage maybe Google tools to understand how your Google advertisements are performing or leverage Facebook tools to understand how your Facebook tools are performing. But you actually don't really want that. What you really want to do is understand those two in comparison with one another. Should I spend more on Google or more on Facebook or any other of these ad channels? You want to understand what the lifetime values of the customers that are brought in from those channels are because they're very often not completely independent of the source. And to do that, you need like not a data source like Google. You need a data source that has ultimately how things played out for some of those customers. So a lot of the next level questions require not one data source, but often at least two or multiple. And you're typically unioning data sets or joining data sets or appending data sets. And that that is one of the places that Mozart tends to shine when you start to answer questions from multiple sources. All right, welcome to today's Vitao podcast. This is Vitao co-founder Ian Naj, and today we have Mr. Peter Fishman. Peter is CEO and co-founder of Mozart Data. Mozart is a full-service modern data platform for centralizing, organizing, and analyzing your data. And it allows business owners, marketing leaders, anyone who's dealing with data, whether that's ad platform data, anything else to really look at the data in, in one place. So it really democratizes, once our data democratizes your data so you don't have to be a data engineer or even really a data analyst to get insights and be able to make better data-driven decisions. And so today we're going to talk all about it and let's dive in. This podcast is brought to you by vidtow.com. Vitao is our free YouTube ad library and spy tool research tool. It's V-I-D-T-A-O.com. At Vitao, we have close to a million unlisted YouTube video ads that you can search, find, discover how they're doing on a day-by-day -day basis. So you can really see what ads your competitors are running, see ads in different markets that you can model to create new winning ads for yourself and a whole lot more. It's all there inside vidtau.com. Plus we have a premium edition. So the database is free to access, but then we also have a premium edition where you have full unlimited access to the database. And inside there, we also provide training. So we also run an agency called Inceptly. That's I-N-C-E-P-T-L-Y, inceptly.com, where we've managed over $150 million on YouTube. It's a video traffic agency, and we've worked with everyone from brands like Descript.com, Huel, to real scrappy direct response, info products, supplements, health, beauty, e-commerce, you name it, we've done it, and love sharing what we've learned. Every week we drop new training in there, everything from YouTube ad media buying to running e-commerce creatives on YouTube, to hardcore tracking and attribution tutorials to really level up your data science game for advertising and everything in between. Right now, as we speak, we're working on a training regarding YouTube shorts. Um, hopefully we'll be live by the time you hear this. On and on and on. This is our passion is video advertising and we wanna share it with you inside of Vidtal Premium. And actually right now, for a limited time, you can get access to Vidtal Premium for a very special price. So if you go to vidtal.com, sign up for free, check out the database, upgrade to premium for this very special price so you get access to all of the database and all the trainings. And also wanted to add that at Inceptly, we do free brainstorm calls with clients like you. So if you ever wanna get help or ask questions about your YouTube ads, your video traffic on other platforms, we're available to chat. Just go to inceptly.com slash call, C-A-L-L, -L, and set up a time to chat. It's free and we'd love to speak with you. Our team's waiting to speak with you. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Peter, welcome to our podcast today. Great to have you on the show. Awesome. Great to be here. So I got to ask you, what is a chief bacon officer? Well, uh, it's probably my best title, um, but but as it applies to my own personal career, um, a little over 10 years ago, um, my now co-founder and also then co-founder, Dan, and I started a hot sauce company called Bacon Hot Sauce. We were the world's first 
bacon flavored hot sauce. So uh, we didn't really take ourselves very seriously, um, though it was really uh, a fun project, fun business. Um, and I like to say we pivoted from the hot sauce world into the data infrastructure world. Uh, but yes, Dan and I ran uh, bacon hot sauce. And on top of it, um, I was the chief bacon officer. <laughs> okay, so because you have this incredible sort of, uh, I guess you could say like, not just Fortune 500, like top 20 companies in the world, data science background during that whole time. So I'm curious, like, how did you incorporate data science into your hot sauce business? So I, I like to say we were one of the, um, you know, savviest DTC businesses at the time. Um, you know, we did a lot of ads analytics and a lot of um, LTV and your, your sort of standard reporting that sort of more mature DTC companies would use. And then, you know, internally, we have a joke that, um, you know, that uh, Slack is an example of a company that was building a video game and then they really were struggling with the video game. So they pivoted to the chat app that they were using to build the video game. And Dan and I used the joke that, you know, we were uh, a DTC business built on top of Shopify in an era where that was hip and cool. And uh, the problem was we just couldn't get the data that we needed to run the, the business really effectively. So we had to build data infrastructure to make that happen. And then that became our true calling with Mozart data. But um, in reality, that's a little bit of a, 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 a joke or a, a non-truth. Um, the reality is Dan and I are both data nerds that happened to love hot sauce, thought the world desperately needed a bacon flavored hot sauce. And then we um, built... Uh, both bacon hot sauce. And then we're working simultaneously, Dan, uh, as sort of a data engineer and backend engineer and myself as a data analyst. And we sort of um, had that, uh, you know, career progression in those fields while simultaneously running a side hustle that uh, sold um, hundreds of thousands of bottles of hot sauce. So did you ever think, did you ever, I mean, did you ever hope or think during your whole tenure at, you know, we're talking about, so you were at, so this started when you were at Walt Disney, right? You started That's, taking that's off. correct. We, yes, okay. the, uh, the, the sort of, uh, Gantt chart of, um, of, uh, my professional career, um, had an overlap of, of Platum and Disney with, with the hot sauce. So, <laughs> and then you're at Yammer, Microsoft. That's also Prince, true. Prince, so Microsoft, Zenefits, Open Door, um, and then also Ease. All this whole time, you're you're running the bacon hot sauce um, side hustle, right? But did you ever hope that your like your side hustle would replace your day job and you could focus on data science for bake, for hot sauce, or was that? I'm just curious how <laughs> that was in the mix at all. Well, I mean, again, I thought for a DTC company, we were using ads really effectively yeah. and um, some of the sort of practices around understanding LTVs and cohorts and mm -hmm. things like that ultimately did become my real profession. Um, and of course, everybody, I think, daydreams about their side hustle becoming their main hustle. Um, I actually uh, had an opportunity uh, to go on the TV show Shark Tank. Uh, to present bacon hot sauce. Sadly, the show never aired. Um, but um, uh, one of the things, yeah, of course, and you know, I think my my boss at at Yammer, um, you know, was uh, always uh, saying, you know, uh, we can't be doing too much, uh, you know, hot saucing when you know we're supposed to be doing uh, Yammer analytics, um, and and you know, very sort of humorously, um, when uh, Microsoft acquired. Um, Yammer, uh, you know, Steve Ballmer came down to our offices in San Francisco and, um, you know, David Sachs's admin said, you know, Fish, I can get you some time uh, with Steve, you know, probably to talk about data. But of course, I ran into the room and and and, and just handed him a bottle of hot sauce and explained like, oh, this is really the the secret sauce of, of, of Yammer. Um, so I there was no shortage of um, shilling. Uh, of my side hustle. But uh, honestly, I felt like, uh, so this is maybe a uh, a post justification, but I actually feel like, you know, understanding certain business dynamics really plays into uh, doing a good job in the data and analytics space. So often one of the things that is missing from the data world is connecting the like 
uh, data finding to the business decision or business action or business outcome. And um, I was so hyper focused on it with respect to that sort of side hustle that I thought it gave me a real um, empathy towards the operators of the business. Um, I think one of the one of the places where analytics teams often err is they get maybe in an ivory tower or a high horse about um, the results that they find, and they don't understand that um, you know pragmatism actually matters and thinking through um, how an operator uh, is maybe time crunched to make decisions. Um, or has to make trade-offs about decisions that might not be as narrow as the problem that you framed um, tends to be one of the real downfalls of analytics teams. So to the extent that I was um, customer-centric and operator-centric as a data scientist, that I thought was a real um, competitive and comparative advantage at that time. Yeah. No, I mean, it makes so much sense because you're coming at it from not like a top-down perspective of starting with the data science and then, you know, you know, like what's the word? Like you know, like a, like an angel descending to earth with your profound knowledge. But you have that obviously that perspective, but then also, like you said, you have this sort of boots on the ground perspective of, hey, are my ads working? Or like, you know, are these customers actually worth what I'm spending? Um, so that's that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's it's funny how that all comes together in in what's our data. So uh, it's kudos to you for for, yeah. for being able to inhabit both of those yeah. perspectives. To steal a Silicon Valley cliche, you know, like uh, I was watching actually Steve Jobs' Stanford commencement just actually a couple of days ago. And there's a line that he has about connecting the dots backwards being, you know, you can't connect the dots forward. So a lot of times you're doing something in life, whether it's bacon hot sauce or, you know, him taking a calligraphy class at Reed. And, you know, you're doing it because you're passionate about it. And um, little did he know that, you know, understanding typography would be ultimately one of the key components to a lot of the Apple products. Mm -hmm. And, um, and similarly, I think like kind of, um, you know, running sort of a DTC business would follow me, not just in my B2C career, but also in my B2B career, because a lot of the products that I joined from a B2B perspective had a lot of, uh, B2C DNA. Mm -hmm. So they thought very deeply about the customer, you know, I grew up in this sort of SaaS era. So this era of moving to the cloud where you had uh, a lot of companies start to adopt a PLG motion, a product-led growth motion where you could target users of your free product, freemium in video games, freemium in B2B SaaS. This was my whole career. And, um, and I think a lot of it kind of is about connecting the dots backwards um, rather than saying, okay, the reason that I'm doing bacon hot sauce today is so that I can be really great at analytics um, a decade from now. That was obviously never the plan. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, taking a step back further too, I'm just curious, you know, your background in economics, like how this, how this connects to you know, I, I think I read something you had an interview. You're talking about how you're working with a data set of like 500,000. You thought that was significant as an, you know, an economist, where now, right, like that is sort of like a drop in the bucket with what you have access to in some of these some businesses. Sure. Uh, obviously, I get to date myself um, with my own personal academic career. So, like many of the people in the field of data science, I am a failed academic. <laughs> Um, very, very proudly, you know, um, loved my time as a graduate student, but ultimately have also loved my, my tech career. Um, and, um, you're absolutely right. Like what passed for analytics, um, sadly two decades ago, um, is, is, you know, it's not obsolete, but it is, um, you know, it's a, it's a fraction of what we are, a, a small fraction of what we're capable of today. So uh, to super date myself, my PhD dissertation was about video rental stores. So, uh, you know, many people have forgotten what those are, but you used to have to drive to a shop so that you could rent, you know, a DVD or a VHS that you would then, you know, watch it at home on a machine, uh, you know, before all the world of, of streaming and all of the streaming services. So um, I did a lot of studies as that world was transitioning and losing market share to services like Netflix 
and trying to understand some of the nuances of customer behavior. I was really obsessed with um, what was then called you know, behavioral economics or psychology and economics, the intersection of psychology and economics and doing empirical work um, in that field and discipline. And um, as you mentioned, um, my dissertation leveraged hundreds of thousands of observations of uh, transactions, which was um, almost miraculous to to get at the time. Um, and, you know, today, when you observe, you know, insights generated off of, you know, hundreds of thousands of observations, you say, well, where are the other billion? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and um, you know, I would say that um, there's actually a skill that I call like um, small data skill in, in, in tech, which is to say, um, if you're running, say, you know, I worked um, at Microsoft and, and, and for part of that time, I worked with the Bing team. And, you know, Bing just has basically a, a countless number of observations. You know, it's uh, it, it's almost unthinkable. You know, and, and I'm as do, you know, many of the large scale services. Um, and when you run an A-B test on Bing, you know, you have condition A, condition B, um, you know, you're going to get a very precise difference between those. You can measure very, very, very small differences. Um, but you often end up cutting the populations and then a lot of that power actually gets reduced. But but even still, there's a certain like easiness of the skill of measuring the mean of A and the mean of B when you have huge numbers of observations in both because you can very precisely measure whether A is bigger or B is bigger. And bigger is like sort of like the interesting question, like what's the success criteria? Um, whereas when you have small data, um, you have this challenge of trying to, you know, tease apart causality or um, identify sort of uh, a meaningful or, or make an assessment of sort of a meaningful win when maybe statistical power isn't there. And, you know, you have to make a decision. You want to make the optimal decision for the company or you want to have a methodology for doing so. And I think that there's actually, you know, one of the benefits um, of my time was like, you know, I learned how to do, I, I would almost call it like analysis with small data, but being very thoughtful about the observations and understanding the bias of these observations, the bias of the, um, of sort of the point estimates, the bias of saying, well, this one looks like it's better than this one. Um, and there's a, there's something actually that's very applicable uh, from that world uh, today. So I think like that skill, again, sort of it's connecting the dots backwards. You know, I, I, when I took my first sort of empirical class in graduate school, um, we had to, you know, now if you wanted to run a regression, there are so many incredible packages that will just like spit out an analysis. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying back in my day, we had to do the linear algebra, but actually uh, when I took my first class, you had to, you know, do the linear algebra to effectively, uh, you know, uh, on small data to, uh, you know, generate decimal. And then, and then in doing so, you really learn um, mm -hmm. some of these concepts. So I like the ability to sort of do it insanely quickly with modern tooling, but having sort of the background of back in my day type, mm -hmm. type, uh, type skills. You're, uh, you're back there using the Fortran and the slide rule. <laughs> after um, you know, there were no slide saying, rules, but, uh, but we, we used, uh, you know, I think, uh, all, all sorts I think of I like data programs. I might be older than you, um, but I, I I wanted to ask you just on a side note. So, did Blockbuster have a chance? So, one of the insights that that I had, and this is this is almost embarrassing to say, I took six years to make this insight. But one of the insights that I had was that um, that people don't really like late fees. So, um, that sounds like. I can't believe I wasted six years of my life to try to tell you that people don't like late fees. Presumably, if I asked like 100 people, like, hey, do you think people like late fees? Actually, like maybe like 99% of them would be like, no. But people react almost um, irrationally against late fees. And, um, and you know, I think like that model was key to the profitability of, you know, if you think about usage-based pricing, which is so popular today, and it's a big part of our model at Mozart, um, Back in the day, there was usage-based pricing in video rental. It was you would rent a video, and then if you if you kept it for more days, there would be like late fees associated with those days, and that you know those late fees would scale up. And um, uh, so you know, basically, uh, I think I think again, some of this stuff ends up being analogous. So you know, was Blockbuster sunk? You know, honestly, probably some of its. Uh, 
you know, pricing meets technology ultimately made it inevitably doomed. Um, obviously, if it could have avoided disruption, but it's it's one of those sort of classic disruption stories. You know, I, um, you know, like uh, the of the Clay Christensen kind of school of disruption. You know, they were making profits. There was a profit center that was harmful to their long run business, which basically, uh, or sorry, or missed the picture of what the you know next initially unprofitable segment would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and um, and that was kind of the sort of just very classic, um, you know, innovator's dilemma type problem. Yeah, interesting. I mean, there's, I still miss the magic of those video stores, just going in there and, you know, you know what I mean? It's, there's, a, there's something to be said for that, but unfortunately, you know, it just didn't make the cut. Um, okay. By the way, I'm I'm someone yeah. that loves streaming services, so I love yeah, yeah. I love hooking on. So I believe me when it's like the last thing I want to do is uh, you know inefficiently uh, drive myself <laughs> miles to a, a, a store. Right. So uh, no no complaints on my end. But some of the romance of walking the aisles and sort of getting the employee picks and all of that stuff, there is sort of a a nice nostalgia to that. Yeah, where do all the video video rental store employees like where do they work now? You know, there's sort of like a sort of a genre of human that would work at the, at the store. Well, Quentin Tarantino, right? Yeah, there you so, go. So, uh, yeah. you know, some of them are, some of them are directors, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, there, there is, uh, you know, there is just like a class of work that is, you know, curation meets, mm-hmm. uh, meets sort of, uh, service. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that, you know, had its moment in time in the video sphere, but I think that there's sort of always roles for um, good curation. Absolutely, maybe they've moved. They've moved to the cloud too, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, very hopefully. Uh, that said, I'm sure some of the jobs become redundant and need to sort of skill in a in a variety of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm curious. So how did you and Dan right come up with? with Mozart data, how did this, how did this idea emerge to, to actually launch this? Like what was your first iteration of Mozart data? Was it service based? What, just curious. So, um, you know, so Dan and I, uh, decided that we wanted to work on a project together. Uh, wasn't sure that we would turn it into a company. Um, but we, we had been friends for 25 years at that point or 20, I think 22 years at that point now 25, but, um, uh, you know, Dan and I wanted to, you know, work on something that was the intersection of our skills, Dan being sort of a back end engineer, data engineer, and me being a data analyst, data scientist, the sort of intuitive thing was to work on something in the data space, the data pipelining space, um, the data modeling space. So something in the realm of, uh, we saw there being this whole wealth of data out there and we wanted to enable somebody better sort of building ourselves at scale um we landed on this idea of building the data infrastructure that we would build at our next company so effectively building ourselves as a service Mm -hmm. so building the data infrastructure that we would bring to more late stage companies bring it to earlier stage companies basically as a product Um, the initial version of mozart unsurprisingly um was sort of uh really just myself and dan so uh we we uh applied to Y Combinator and ultimately were accepted, not having any real customers or a full vision for the product. And we grinded our, ourselves to try to get, you know, one or two design partners that ultimately became customers. But, you know, uh, you know, very romantically, I say like the initial versions of Mozart was, you know, somebody interacting um with an interface that would effectively cue me and Dan to do something that, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of sort of mechanical Turk involved, which mm-hmm. is to say, oh, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously interacting with the machine, you know, it's effectively Dan spinning up, um, uh, maybe their warehouse or, 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 uh, a variety of what ultimately became our product. So, um, the, the romance of it is, um, is a lot nicer now that we truly do have that, that automation baked in, but ultimately you were initially buying myself and Dan as a service and, and actually it was myself and Dan, uh, as a service. So, um, you know, that story, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun, but it, it was sort of very like, uh, nerve wracking at the time. And I, you know, I, I'm very glad we've productized our, our offerings. I mean, because that's challenging. I know like, uh, my co-founder's way more involved with all the 
the, the data side of things for the businesses that we work with, but it's, you know, there's this wrong, there's this romantic idea that you can have some kind of self-service onboarding of all your different data sources, but it just like, it almost never seems to work, at least, you know, in the first iteration of trying to combine those particular data sources, there's so much manual work involved. Um, yeah. So I'm just, I'm actually in awe of how you've been able to, like you said, productize all that manual labor. So were you, were you intentionally as you're, you and Dan are behind the scenes, like pulling the puppet strings, you're intentionally building it so that you only have to do that once or a minimum number of times, or how did that go? So, um, very rarely do we build something once. Um, you know, I think there's, there's always yeah. iterative processes. Right, right, right. Um, but ultimately, we are trying to glue together um, in a really effective way um, the core components of the modern data stack, which is basically extract and load, warehousing, and transformation. So, um, so to the you know, uh, to what extent is one process repeatable? Um, you know, a lot of sort of um, uh, managing uh, warehousing is 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 ca you're capable of doing that at scale. A lot of the transformations, there are some that are out of the box where they apply universally to certain SaaS tools that you might be using. Um, and then a lot of them are more one-off, but you want to sort of save those use cases um, because a lot of them translate across companies. But um, as, you know, I would say that part of our solution is to sit on top of uh, amazing solutions. So um, we, you know, we sit on top of uh, white label Fivetran and, and Snowflake, in addition to other sources. Um, and ultimately, we think that that gives us a best in class offering that we really want. Um, we want anybody uh, to uh, effectively use and accelerate themselves. And if we weren't going to be recommending Mozart or a service like Mozart, um, we would recommend the components. Um, mm. It's it's exactly what we would do um, for ourselves at, at any company. So it's really nice to be able to look myself in the mirror and say, um, this is a best in class product that we're out, you know, uh, trying to to sell every day. But not only that, you know, we would use it very much ourselves. And in fact, you know, one of our best customers is Mozart Data itself. So um, we write lots and lots of custom transformation and we leverage lots and lots of what we call sort of out of the box transformation and then out of the box uh, charting. Yeah, I mean, so what, you know, to be able to provide companies with the ability to like democratize their data so that, um, you know, dumb marketers like me can go in and like see like, oh yeah, let's, we can see the relationship here very clearly. Um, that's super powerful. I'm just curious, you know, what are some of the really outstanding um, transformations in terms of before and after Mozart data that you've seen for some of the companies you've worked with? Just off the top well, of your head. Great. Well, first of all, we would never re refer to uh, dumb marketers. Um, <laughs> yeah, any I do. Of our, yeah. one of, many of our best comp customers are true operators. Um, mm -hmm. Some in the marketing space, some in the revenue space, some in the business space. So um, there is a real wave of very data savvy and very data capable, mm -hmm. um, not just marketers, but but general business operators. Okay. And um, that is on, on some level our ICP, that rather than uh, have the bottleneck be their abilities to get data, which involve typically data engineering skills that many of them you know, don't have or can't really invest the time to uh, to learn or shouldn't invest the time to learn. Um, we want to empower them with the data engineering and make the challenge for them the ability to, to take a really smart look at the data. Um, can they look and cut their data in a smart way? And that's how you should compete, right? Like we should be asking um, we should be asking our marketers, you know, be smart about this data, understand what's driving what, um, not, uh, go learn how to get the data or fetch the data. That's a solved problem. So it is, you know, the, the thesis that we have as a company is, uh, effectively don't invest in people that are sort of good at everything or okay at everything, invest in people that are great at certain things. So I'd rather have a marketer that's great 
at marketing, at like sort of being sort of data aware and data responsive and and sort of being knowing what they want from the data, then invest in a marketer who's, you know, uh, you know, an adequate data engineer and an adequate marketer and an adequate like that's that that will always lose is mm-hmm. is our core thesis. So, you know, so we, you know, being very blunt and direct and taking the exact opposite side. No, we don't expect our marketers to be the caliber of data engineer that Dan is. And mm-hmm. and if you know those people, um, they're true unicorns because Dan is really exceptional as a as a data engineer, but he's definitely not exceptional as a marketer. So not everybody can be everything. And you know, um, you know, sometimes you know, I I, I look at uh, let's say like an athlete like LeBron, who's the best shooter and passer and defender and this and that. it's like well sure there are there are you know sort of these one in a million uh outliers um but you know short i mean or even or even fewer in lebron's case but like you know in in this world i think you want to get somebody that's you know our big philosophy is depth in something that's that's really important so mm-hmm. then that was a long way of not answering your question your question is like what uh, what transforms are people leveraging, especially on the marketing side? And, you know, a typical marketing question tends to be around um, attribution. Mm-hmm. So very uh, many tools help you analyze um, within the bubble of that tool. So it's simple to, you know, use le- and leverage maybe Google tools to understand how your Google advertisements are performing or leverage Facebook tools to understand how your Facebook tools are performing. But you actually don't really want that. Um, What you really want to do is understand those two in comparison with one another. Should I spend more on Google or more on Facebook or any other of these ad channels? You want to understand what the lifetime values of the customers that are brought in from those channels are because they're very often not um, completely independent of the source. Um, and to do that, you need like not a data source like Google, you need a data source that has ultimately how things ultimately played out um, for some of those customers. So uh, a lot of the next level questions require not one data source, but often at least two or multiple. And you're typically, you know, unioning data sets or joining data sets or appending data sets. Um, and, um, that is one of the places that that Mozart tends to shine when you start to answer questions from multiple sources. Got it. Very cool. Um, yeah, incredibly useful. So I'm I'm curious, just pivoting to just talking about how you've been able to grow Mozart. Just uh, what experiments have you done in terms of um, you know acquisition? Uh, what has worked for you, given that you have access to all this data? And just, you know, what are some of your learnings on the acquisition side? Sure. So um, unsurprisingly, we're huge users of Mozart data. So we have a good sense for, you know, some of the ROI on some of these activities. Um, and largely, I, I'd say we, we've committed the cardinal sin, which is we've tried to do basically everything. So we've tried, we've gone very scattershot. So we've tried a bunch of different advertising channels. We've tried a bunch of different content plays. We've tried a bunch of different SEO. We've tried a bunch of uh, different um, sort of uh, network and network expansion and organic type growth and referral and and all of these these things. And, and you know, some of the best stuff is very much non-scalable. It's um, me interacting in the Y Combinator community mm. or it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's sort of starting that snowball effect. So starting to develop use cases, but doing so in a non-scalable way, just like I mentioned with our first customers where we ourselves were sort of uh, behind the screen. So, um, so you know, when I think about sort of the ad channels that have been effective for us, well, we're a um, hyper-targeted uh, B2B company. So, you know, if you're selling ice cream, Um, basically the TAM on that is basically anybody who's not like lactose intolerant. And now there's like a lactose uh, free ice cream. So, uh, yeah. yeah, So, so it's really like everybody should love ice cream. It's like a perspective of mine. Maybe not everybody does, but um, you know, if you're advertising ice cream, you know, you're basically your, your addressable market is de facto everyone, or maybe not everyone, but close. Um, And when you're trying to sell a B2B data product, 
um, that's specifically targeted at SMB data leaders um, where that title might not have data in it in the first place. You know, you mentioned some of the classic operators that end up having really uh, large data responsibilities or get saddled with the organization's data responsibilities. Um, now you're talking about a very challenging um, sort of uh, need to really hyper, to do hyper, you can't do hyper targeting, you know, like, you know, if you're selling maybe an, I, I used to work for uh, an HR tool and you could target leaders of HR and they're very identifiable through uh, maybe their LinkedIn title. Um, but when you're selling to a technical audience that is generally like ads reluctant or cold outreach reluctant, and uh, that audience is sort of uh, not necessarily findable. So nobody walks around with a big sign above their head that says, okay, I am uh, a data leader without a data title um, at the exact right moment to make a deep investment in my data infrastructure um, and make the decision about, you know, sort of maybe what cloud warehouse I, I want to go with. Uh, very few people are wearing like a t-shirt that says, you know, that and talk to me. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a real skill in trying to peak interest at this, this window. So, you know, before you're a company with any data, uh, we're not a particularly valuable tool to you. And once you, you know, you're an enterprise that's set up, uh, you know, a million sort of uh, data dependencies um, and have sort of some of the core pipelining, again, probably less value. Um, and it's just really about getting folks at the right moment in time. So, you know, when you think about sort of advertising to that, it's about really understanding um, that moment in time and when, when and how people are getting value and what resonates about uh, the value offer. Mm, interesting. So what, in terms of the, is it, is the free trial what you've always run? Is that typically how people come on board? So one of the best things about the data world now, and one of the worst things for me as the leader of a data company is that people expect to see value before they will pay you a dollar. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, in my mind, great for the world and me as a data tools buyer, great for me yeah. on the other side of that coin. Um, but, you know, running a data company, yes, there's a real challenge. I have to show you that my tool, I'm not going to tell you that it's valuable. I have to show you that it's valuable. And um, our way of doing that is um, it is effectively a free offering. And if you're getting a lot of value out of it, that's great. And we'd love to have you on board uh, as a customer. And the problem there is, you know, does a customer want to invest their time and energy? Free is great, but it's nothing's free. There's no such right. thing as a free lunch. Um, and, you know, there's no sort of sneaky terms. It's just the challenge is, is it worth um, half an hour or an hour of your time to set up this data infrastructure, knowing that you may or may not actually want to use it. So, um, so look, I am very proud to offer a really compelling uh, free trial, and we want our customers to succeed and win uh, during that trial. And if not, um, you know, uh, more power to them uh, as as non customers. And and when they do join, many of the ones that you know saw value in that trial not only like sign up, but then ultimately scale their usage um, quite a bit. And that's really where we're successful as a company. I mean, like many uh, other players, you know, the SMB sale tends to be very 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 thin on uh, margin or value uh, to our company, but. Um, you know, when our customers win and get a lot of value out of data, they end up consuming a lot more of it. And that's really like how we thrive as a business. But, you know, hopefully that sort of data usage is what's super valuable to our customers. And often we find that they're getting um, so many times uh, the value, so, you know, such great ROI from using that data and typically at the center of using it and using it with a lot of ease is is Mozart data. So what, what are there any sort of... Uh... I guess green flags or key moments where you can identify someone, a company that's going to be a really solid Mozart data user. Like is, is there, I'm just curious in the sort of free, free trial to become a, a paid user and 
I'm just curious, like what what indicators do you look for? Well, I mean, typically it's setting up data sources and transformations. Right. So there's no um, aha moment, right? So mm -hmm. Facebook famously said, if you get seven friends, um, now Facebook's got you. Okay. Right. Like, uh, and um, so you know. Uh, you know, you're going along, you've made six friends and, you know, they're, they're posting pictures sporadically and then you get your seventh and it's like, okay, you're off to the yeah. races. So that doesn't really happen. Um, I, I doubt it happens at Facebook. And then similarly, it doesn't happen for Mozart. Um, you know, as you make, uh, basically as you connect data sources and more data is flowing into your warehouse, as you clean that data, um, it, you know, cleaning the data is a perfect signal, but again, the causality is a little bit ambiguous. Um, you're not necessarily getting a lot more value from clean data, though you likely are. Um, it's more that folks that are getting value downstream in their BI tool and, and doing some of their ad hoc analysis and reporting based on it are going to want to make sure that the answers that they're getting are right and consistent mm -hmm. and robust. And to do that, you typically clean up your data and write transformations um, upstream of the tools that you use to analyze it. So um, in some sense, when we see a transformation being written or when we see multiple sources going into a transformation, Gosh, that is a really good, healthy symbol for um, the companies getting a lot of value from the data, and um, it's going to work out with Mozart in the long run. Nice, that's fantastic. Um, so, what's next? Like, do you see? Is there? Do you see people scaling their SMB and then hitting this other level of need that Mozart data can then fulfill, or is this sort of this this window that you see Mozart data playing in sort of happily? Forward. Um, the answer is yes. So, so by that I mean all of the things. Yeah. So in general, um, while we love our progress and we love the growth that we're experiencing, um, people should be growth greedy, right? Mm -hmm. They should be, um, if there is a real opportunity in the market and we're firm believers um, in the opportunity of data right now, big tailwinds, um, big opportunities for companies needs to become more sophisticated, but not just do that, replace their data engineers um, with uh, with basically data savvy and data capable. Um, and um, we think that this is a really amazing opportunity in the SMB space. We also think it's an opportunity up market, typically with small teams at, at large scale companies. So um, we think of, um, you know, shortcutting the the you know steps needed to you know build um you know a a a world class data pipeline as incredibly powerful at companies of a variety of sizes so on the one hand you know our current you know uh, ideal customer looks like you know a series a ish company that's mm -hmm. like seed or seed plus all the way up to b or c um, and sort of in that like a sweet spot where they have some data, they're growing and they're scaling. And this is like an amazing time, you know, and, and a great field time for us to really help them accelerate their data journey almost in, you know, under an hour. So that's certainly our ICP today. And what we'd really like to do is move to the left and to the right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, focus on really, you know, constantly building and winning for that use case. But then, you know, basically invite people to try us even earlier from a cost compelling standpoint, from an answers compelling standpoint. So building a lot of more out of the box um, so that you can get, you know, value faster, you know, faster to value. Um, and then also build to the right. So build for, you know, as, as team scale, we have amazing design partners. We have amazing companies in our ecosystem today that you know, are hitting that next phase of data and analytics. Mm -hmm. um, and they're telling us what they want, what they care about, what a company like theirs at this new stage and phase um, cares about. So, um, you know, the answer is uh, you should be focused, you should be hyper-focused. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, there's really amazing populations of data hungry, um, both to the left and right of our, our, of our ideal customer today. That's fantastic. Again, bringing it bringing it to the masses and also you know, going deep where where you can. That's that's fantastic. So so Paul, where where can people try it out? Where can people go and and try out Mozart data for themselves? Sure. I mean, the best place to start 
is moatstartdata.com. Um, you can self-serve and uh, sign up for a free trial, um, be off to the races in under an hour, um, or uh, you can schedule a demo. And uh, you know, one of our team will not only like walk you through the Mozart offering, but you know, help you actually give you a push in the back. Um, and if any of these pieces are daunting, um, we're a big believer in the hardest step is the first step, mm. right? So if you can get started uh, at MozartData.com, um, I think you'll find yourself quickly in a world of understanding how data can be really powerful in your organization. That's fantastic. Um, Peter, thank you so much for, for taking the time to chat with us today. And, and uh, yeah, big believer in what, what you got going on there. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Enjoyed the conversation. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of VidTal Podcast. Again, my name is Ian Naj, co-founder of VidTal, and really appreciate you having a listen. And it means a lot. So if you have any feedback, go ahead and email us at info at vidtal.com. Love to hear your ideas for future shows, future guests. If you want to be a guest, let us know. Love to chat. Also, just as a reminder, this show has been sponsored by VidTal, which is our free YouTube ad library, vidtal.com. Again, you can go to VidTal and look up over a million ads at this point inside of VidTal. They're all unlisted YouTube ads. You can see what your competitors are running, track the results on a day-by-day basis, find new ads inside of our YouTube ad library, VidTal. And we also have a premium edition of VidTal. So the library is free to access. But for full unlimited access to the library, we have a premium edition of VidTal. We also have training from our Inseply.com agency, which is our sister company to VidTal, where we've managed over $150 million on YouTube. We provide training on media buying, creatives, tracking, copywriting, everything in between. It's all there inside of VidTal Premium. And right now we're running a very special deal on VidTal Premium. And you can go claim that right now at vidtow.com. When you sign up for free, you'll see the offer to join premium and go there and check that out. And last thing, we also do uh, free brainstorm calls with our agency, Inseply. Go to inseply.com slash call. And we love brainstorming with you on your video advertising and just marketing in general. Love to chat. So inseply.com slash call, C-A-L-L. Would love to speak with you. So thanks again for joining us and looking forward to the next show. In the meantime, have a great week.